Amen. Well, we're in Acts chapter 14 today. We're going to cover the first 18 verses of this chapter. What we've seen so far through our journey of Acts is so much, but I'm going to try and recap it as quick as possible. Are you ready? It started with a command from Christ to make disciples, to be witnesses in this world, starting in Jerusalem and out to the end of the world. And as we've walked through the book of Acts, we've seen the church come into being. They started. They started to grow. Then persecution came, and they scattered, but it didn't knock them down. Instead, it made them stronger. And the persecuted church starts sprouting up in different places, including a place called Antioch in Syria. Now, we have, and we're following, Paul and Barnabas. Paul, who was changed from a murderer and a persecutor of the church, now as an apostle of Jesus Christ. And we see Paul and Barnabas traveling in their first missionary journey. And I have a clicker to show you a map because we're in a different place than we were last week. They're going to be changing this up. And so I'm going to take control for a second. Scott, can I do that? I'm going to, okay, good. I got the thumbs up. This is the Mediterranean Sea. You can see Italy, right? And our little, my little home, home, homeland, you know, little, a little Sicily there, the boot in there. We are way over here. This is Jerusalem. I'll, I'll put some markers on there. There we go. Put some markers. There's Jerusalem. That's where all of the book of Acts started. And, and it started uh, going up towards Antioch and Syria. I'm going to zoom in because I can do that. And I'm fancy like that, guys. Look at that. Your pastor knows technology. Huh? IT specialist here. No, don't, don't come to me with that stuff. Uh, but now we, they started in Antioch and Syria right here. They made it to this island of Cyprus. Last week we saw them go from here all the way up to Antioch and Pisidia. And now they moved over to Iconium, which is this top dot, and Lystra is a bottom dot. And that's the setting we're in in this chapter. Does that make sense? They're still... That's a pretty far distance. Like we think, oh, that's just like a few minute walk down the road. No, that's like 50 miles and they had to walk. They couldn't, they walked or rode on a, on a donkey or a horse. They didn't just get in their automobile and drive 50 miles, no problem. They, we didn't, they didn't have that technology. That was a long journey for them. What they've done so far is an incredibly long journey that most people in this time period never did for any reason. And this is being done on behalf of Christ. What a sacrifice, first of all. But we see this setting now. They're in Iconium and Lystra. They are uh, start off in verses 1 through 7 in Iconium. And they eventually find that persecution that we read about during that medi scripture reading, that meditation that we had, and they fled to Lystra, and we're going to look at that as well. But what is important to us is just this. The apostles' task here to carry the gospel to the far reaches of the earth did not end with them. Paul and Barnabas are dead. They are with the Lord in heaven, but the mission is not over. So who does the mission now? You. Me. Us. That's who does it. We need to step up. Because if there's anything I've learned about people in my 31, almost 32 years of life, it's this. We don't like to do things ever. We live, and I think men are probably the worst about this, Men exist and work and, and, and work really hard throughout the week so that they can come home on Friday night and do absolutely nothing. That's what men like to do. We don't like to do a single thing. Now, ladies are, have a little more, to the credit of the ladies, I really think ladies have a credit of they have an internal drive to want to do things. Men don't want to do anything 
and it drives us that way and it bleeds into our church life because we think, man, if I could just sit here on these comfy seats oh, and just relax while, while Bob does some singing and I could just listen and, oh, yeah, mm, right there, that's the feels, right? And that's what we want to do in the church, but that's not what we're meant to do. We're meant to carry on the same mission. Look at how much trouble, how much of a burden this missionary journey has been so far, and it's not even close to being over. They travel more and more. It's crazy. This is crazy what they're doing. This is probably the halfway mark for them. So they got all of this to do again. And by the way, Paul does multiple missionary journeys. And what do we do? Complain about talking to our neighbors. Complain about talking with our coworkers about Christ. We don't like to do anything. And it's time for you. It's time for me. Time for us to step up. And that's what we're going to see here are a few principles, few things that we should remind ourselves for the missionary task that God has entrusted with you today. And the first one's really simple. It comes out of that first verse there in 14. It says this, Now at Iconium they entered together into the Jewish synagogue and spoke in such a way... They spoke in such a way that a great number of Jews and Greeks believed. The first principle, the first reminder you need is this. Your how affects your what. Let me say that again. Your how, how you say something, affects what you're saying. You want to know how this principle lives out? in your life every day, if you go and you ask your, your wife or your, your spouse, your husband, uh, for anything, if Rachel asks me to do something, take out the trash or something, she knows this now after, well, starting to know this after nine years of marriage, but I like things in a very direct way. I like it right then and there. I like it laid out for me. I like it as simple as possible. We talked a little bit about that in, in Sunday school. Simple as possible. Jamie, can you take the trash out right now? If she just says, hey, the trash is getting kind of full. What do you think about that? I'm never going to pick up on that, guys. You could give me 100 tries. I will never understand what she's saying. And, and it, it, it's hard, right? The how affects the what. She's trying to convey a message and if she doesn't say it in a way that I understand, it won't work. Why is it that we have missionaries right here in Cincinnati that are reaching a population that we cannot possibly reach? Like Amr, he is preaching and sharing the gospel with Arabic-speaking people. Why can't you guys do that? We don't speak Arabic. At least I don't think anyone in here does. There is a natural barrier, and the how affects the what. And in this passage, as they are going to the Jewish synagogue, they spoke in such a way. It is important for you to understand this. You need to speak in a way that relates to people. In other words, don't be that person that just walks in front of people and starts regurgitating, throwing up words that have no meaning to them out of nowhere. Don't walk up to that person in Kroger and just start spouting off. Have that relationship. Our culture today values that relationship. They value that time that you spend with them and love on them. If you have a friend that needs to know Christ, don't just sit there and bash them over the head with the Bible over and over again. Instead, Take time to open Scripture in front of them and talk with them about it, gentle and with respect, as First Peter says. There is a way about how we communicate the gospel that helps for when people hear the gospel. Paul and Barnabas knew this. 
They understood the unique cultural elements of this Gentile city. And so they took the time to say it in such a way. We saw a good example of that last week as well when they would talk and they would share it with the community, the synagogue community there, and they shared it in a way that they understood. They referred to Old Testament passages. They talked to them little by little because they knew their people. It is hard to talk to people sometimes. And many of us don't know what to say. But I'll tell you a common thread, a practical piece of advice for sharing the gospel with anyone is to start simple. How can I pray for you? Every person in this world needs prayer. And that question opens the door for you to share Christ with those people. Your family, your friends, your co-workers, your neighbors. When you ask that, it shows that you actually care. It shows that you're actually going to do it. And do it. Don't just say it. Actually pray for them. Maybe even right then and there pray with them. Because that's what we should do. That's how we should do it. And it's such an important way that, as I already mentioned, 1 Peter 3 mentions that we should communicate the gospel with gentleness and respect. Colossians 4, 3-4 says that, uh, this is Paul writing this, he says, Pray also for us that God may open to us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I am in prison. Right? Pray for us that I can do this, share the what, the gospel, and then it says this, that I may make it clearer, which is how I ought to speak. I think knowing the basic gospel is important to communicating the basic gospel. We overcomplicate things in our minds. We overcomplicate it so much that it is a gift and a, a real skill to explain complex things to young children. That's why we have great teachers that teach so well to these children where I would be pulling my hair out trying to talk to them. I know this personally. We, we've been homeschooling our kids, and Rachel knows how frustrated I get just trying to teach math to these kids. Because for me, I'm just like, that's the answer. That's why it's the answer, guys. Come on. You should know this. Like, yeah, 2 plus 2 equals 4. Duh. But no, they have to break it down in a simple way. Teachers have that skill. And when we communicate the gospel to people, we don't need to overcomplicate it. It's very simple. Can I tell you a very simple way to share the gospel? I get it from John chapter 9, the blind man who is healed. And I've referenced this multiple times because I think it is the most basic and simple way to share your faith. He says this, All I know is this, I was once blind, but now I see. The basic sharing of your faith is that. You were once this way, a drunkard, a drug addict, a womanizer, a, a, a cruel and, and hated person. You just were angry with the world. You were this way, stuck in your sin, or as, as Ephesians says, dead in your trespasses. That's how you were, but then you met Christ. And now, you are not that way. You still sin. You're not perfect. But now, you are made alive in Jesus. That, that resonates with people. The simple gospel right there. I once was dead and now I'm alive. I once was blind, but now I see. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Share that with people. You don't have to know the Romans road by heart. You don't have to know a thousand things to memorize in the Bible because some of us in here, some of you, I, I can't even do all of that. 
It's part of my job to read the Bible every day, right? And it's still hard to memorize it, guys. I don't blame you. There's a lot of words in there. And it's complicated. Do not complicate this. It should be the most natural thing in the world to share your faith with people. How many people in this room were talking about the Bengals every single day during the playoffs? A lot of us. You can talk about Jesus. I'm telling you, he's way more important than Joe Burrow. Okay? You can talk about him. It should be natural. You shouldn't be able to help yourself. So communicate it. Make it clear. Keep it simple. Uh, in Nehemiah chapter 8, this is a special passage for me because Nehemiah is the first book I ever went through uh, when I was here. So that's the first book we went through together as a church, which is awesome. And Nehemiah 8, they open the book, the law, in front of the people. So kind of like what we're doing here, opening the book in front of the people, and they read from the book, from the law of God, and this is what it says. They read from it clearly and gave the sense so that the people understood the reading. My goal every time I stand up here in the pulpit is to open this, read it clearly, and give it sense to you. So there's no confusion on what it means. That is what they're doing in the Jewish synagogue there in verse 1 of chapter 14. They spoke in such a way, and you should learn to speak in such a way. You don't have to be eloquent. You don't have to preach a sermon. You don't have to do anything but say, I was once this, but now I'm this. And if you're having trouble even getting to that point, Ask them what they need to pray for. It's a simple, simple way to get into conversation. Don't complicate it too much. Please don't do it. It's so hard to do that. We like to complicate. But what happens when we speak in such a way is amazing because they spoke in such a way that a great number of both Jews and Greeks believed, so much so that it made an impact on the people. The, in verse 2, we see persecution starting to boil under the surface. The unbelieving Jews started to stir up the Gentiles. They probably spread rumors. They probably said things about these people. And they started really making trouble for Paul and Barnabas. And they poisoned, as it says, poisoned their minds. You won't win everyone over. But don't let that discourage you. We saw that last week when they left Antioch, Pisidia, and they started walking over to Iconium. They shook the dust off of their feet. This is because they knew they can't win everybody over. Some people's hearts will be closed to the gospel. They will close it themselves. They will harden their hearts as Pharaoh did. Paul and Barnabas still stayed for a long time. This was around uh, the year 47 AD, just, I guess, around 12, 13 years after Christ was crucified. So not all within the same time frame. And they stayed there in Iconium preaching. And it says this, they, they preached uh, boldly. They uh, bore witness to the word of his grace. And they were granting signs and wonders to be done by their hands. They did those three things. Preaching boldly. That was a how. They never stopped. They kept going. They were making sense of it. They were clearly proclaiming God's word. They bore witness. They were telling what they've experienced in their lives. And then they were doing signs and wonders. This is a who. This is the audience they were doing it to. When you are sharing the gospel, remember, you have the who. You have people in your life, people that need to hear the gospel. Pray for those people. Love those people. And then go to those people and share with them this truth of the gospel. That's what we see there. Then the Jewish people have created this divide uh, what we see here is that 
in verse 5, it says, uh, an attempt was made by both Gentiles and Jews, and then this phrase, with the rulers. The rulers means that it possibly was something um, political. It was something that uh, they didn't like the fact that they were drawing a crowd, and they wanted to maintain this control over the people. So they started stirring it up. They started causing division. And, and then finally, they made the plans to mistreat them and to stone them. So to harm them, but also the intent to kill. Just as Stephen was martyred in Acts 7, we see this now happening again in Acts 14. These men were about to die. But by the grace of God and the providence of God, they heard of it. And they left. And they left to Lystra and Derby. And they, in verse 7, they never stopped doing their mission. They weren't intimidated by that. They didn't leave out of fear. They left in the same way they left Antioch, Pisidia. They shook the dust off of their feet and they went to the next place. The next place is actual, actually Lystra. And what we see in verse 8 through 18 is our experience there. I'm going to read it before we get into the next little section, and the next uh, reminder uh, for you out of this text. But let's read 8 through 18 together. Now at Lystra, there was a man sitting who could not use his feet. He was crippled from birth and had never walked. He listened to Paul speaking, and Paul, looking intently at him, and seeing that he was of faith to be made well, said in a loud voice, Stand upright on your feet. And he sprang up and began walking. And when the crowd saw what Paul had done, they lifted up their voices, saying in Lyconian, The gods have come down to us in the likeness of men. Barnabas they called Zeus and Paul Hermes because he was the chief speaker. And the priests of Zeus, whose temple was at the entrance to the city, brought oxen and garlands to the gates and wanted to offer sacrifice with the crowds. But when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of it, they tore their garments and rushed out into the crowd, crying out, Men, why are you doing these things? We also are men of like nature with you. And we bring you good news that you should turn from these vain things to a living God who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. In past generations, he allowed all the nations to walk in their own ways, yet he did not leave himself without witness. For he did good by giving you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. And then the sad verse of this chapter, even with these words, they scarcely restrained the people from offering sacrifice to them. What we see at the start of this uh, passage, a secondary passage here in verse 8, <clears throat> 8 through 10, is, uh, is what we would kind of consider a typical miracle story, right? Uh, a, a crippled man, uh, he was unable to walk, is given strength again and is able to walk. Now, this reminds me and probably reminds you of a similar story out of Mark chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. If you want to, uh, if you have your Bibles, turn there, and we're going to look at the similarities in this, in this chapter. Mark 2, so it's not very far, so don't go too far. <clears throat> Mark chapter 2, starting in verse 1 we see, as you can probably look at your subheading in your Bible, the healing of the, the paralytic. And what Jesus does in this, and I won't read the whole passage, is he is teaching and preaching. And in verse 3, four friends bring a paralyzed man to Jesus. They lower him through the roof because the crowd is so thick they can't get through them. So they lower this man down the roof in front of Jesus. Jesus sees the faith of the four men in verse 5, and he says to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. But that's not good enough for the Pharisees. 
the Pharisees are angry by that. Who is this guy to forgive sins? So Jesus says, I did it for your sake. But now, if you can't handle that, I'll say it in this way. And he says in verse 11, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And in verse 12, the paralyzed man rose, picked up his bed, and did exactly what Christ said. Do you not see the parallels between this story of Christ and the miracles that Paul and Barnabas just did in Lystra? The sheer fact that a man who is paralyzed is made well using similar, similar language, get up and walk again, and it happens, it's all very similar to what Christ did. They're doing what Christ wants them to do. And here's an amazing thing. The people in, verse, in Mark 2.12 are amazed at this, and they say, we've never seen anything like this. Well, in Acts 14, in verse 10, when they see this, uh, or in verse 11, when they see this, they lift up their voices. They're, they're excited. They're amazed by what just happened. But their response is slightly different, isn't it? In Jesus' time, no one said anything like this. But here in this pagan city that worshiped multiple gods, they look at Barnabas and Saul and they say, the gods have come down in the likeness of man. They think Barnabas is Zeus and that Paul is Hermes, the speaker of the gods. And they think this is just a, 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 an amazing thing in front of them. <clears throat> we may not think that any person in this world is actually a manifestation of of an ancient Greek god, but we sure do worship them like that sometimes. Don't we? And we think that these people are so great. Why do you think ad agencies put celebrities in, in these, these positions where they're telling the public about the health benefits of this medicine? Those guys, those sports athletes, those actors, they don't know anything. That's, they, half of them didn't even go to college. But we're listening to them, and they're like, oh, man, they're just so smart. I, I got to buy that. I got to buy that new energy drink. I got to do this. I got to do that. We listen to people that have influence. We love to, to raise men up and say these kind of things. And this comes from a simple truth here, a simple reminder about our culture. Our culture today is seeking some kind of truth. You hear that? Some kind of truth. Not the truth, just any truth out there. And they latch on to these people and they want to hear what they say. Who cares what they say? And I'll tell you, Christians are no exceptions. We idolize preachers. We have these famous celebrity pastors. What an oxymoron. Celebrity pastors that we think are the bee's knees, the best guys ever and man that is a holy man and if you saw him you'd throw down your coats in front of him and wave palm branches no we shouldn't do that stuff yes i know people's ministries are incredible yes i know there are awesome churches out there and there are awesome preachers out there but we should never 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 do what these people are doing and inflate who these men are to say, oh, this man is like Zeus, and this one's Hermes, and this preacher over here, he's the greatest thing. Oh, shame on us. Just like Paul and Barnabas say, we're just like you. We're men in the same likeness of the same nature. Those people out there, those people we latch onto, we leech onto, they're men. They're just people. We don't have to idolize them like this. But we are guilty of this as well. And the crowd lifts up their voice and they are 
praising these men and shame on them and shame on us. There's no doubt in my mind that Paul thinks of this very incident when he's writing about himself and Apollos in 1 Corinthians 3. This is what he says. There there was a division in the Corinthian church. Some people would say, uh, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos. And Paul says this, Are you not being merely human? What then is Apollos? What is Paul but servants through whom you believed as the Lord assigned to each? And Paul's writing this, he says, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. I love that when he says, what? What is Apollos? What? I like that. What is Paul? Not who. He's bringing them down even more, saying, come on, we're not that important. God just used us to reach you, but don't, don't, don't think that we're Hermes and Zeus. Don't think that we're better than we are. Don't just be, as he says there, merely human. But instead, the one worth praising is God. The one worth boasting in is God. I admire a lot of good, great preachers in this world, and I hope you do too. I hope you are listening to other preachers other than Jamie on Sunday morning. Because there's a lot out there that give the word in such a great way. But never think, never think that they are more than just human. Never think that those pastors out there are holier in some magnificent way that God is going to sit them at his right hand. We like to think that sometimes. I love a lot of preachers. I love Billy Graham so much. And he made such a personal impact on my life through his crusades and probably through your life as well. Many of you in here. But he was also just a man. And he would say that. Praise the Lord for men like that with the humility like Paul has. We have a tendency to cling to such poor substitutes for God. So even the unsaved, even the lost in the world like these men in Lystra, they want to cling to these gods. They want to cling to something that makes them feel like they're doing something right a cause, a person that they can stand behind. They're trying to seek out some kind of truth. But guess what? You have the real truth. You have the real gospel. You have exactly what they need, and you know it. So what is the response? It's to act exactly like Paul and Barnabas here. It's to do this. To share the truth. Oh, I went too fast. To share the truth even if no one listens. Share the truth. You know it. They're looking for it. Billy Graham, a preacher I admire, always said there was a God-shaped hole in everyone's heart. And we try to fill it in all sorts of ways. And you may fill it with drugs and alcohol. You may fill it with good things, good things, like working hard and making a name for yourself and pulling yourself up by your bootstraps and helping out your family and providing for them. You may even do what you think is right in this world to do, but it's not good enough and you will never fill the void. You will never fill that hole in your heart. The only thing that can fit in that hole is God. Because it's a God-shaped hole in your heart. The only thing that will ever satisfy you is God. We try to put bad and poor substitutes in there, but nothing, nothing will satisfy us. The world out there needs 
the truth. They may try to fill their life with poor substitutes. You know the truth. You know the gospel. Many of you here have gone to church your entire life. It's time to do something with that. There is a lost and dying world out there thinking that Zeus and Hermes are walking on this earth still. It's your time to shine. It is your time to share the truth with those people who are looking for some kind of truth. And you share the truth, even if no one listens. And that's what they do, because in verse 14, they hear what they're saying, and they immediately, and I like the order of this, it says Barnabas and Paul. Barnabas probably took lead on this. He was probably the one that rushed in first, and Paul followed. And they rushed in, and they tore their garments That was a symbol of this day of sorrow, of of regret, of being upset. And they tore it and they shouted out to them, we are men of like nature. And they took this opportunity to proclaim the truth to them, the good news of the gospel to them, the news that they came here to present, not just to act like Zeus and Hermes, but the news of Jesus, of God. And they wanted to share that with them. They told them in verse 15 to turn away from these vain things, these false gods, and turn instead to the living God, the real God, the one and only God, the God who created everything in this world, including you and including me, Every little detail about you God created, turn away from the vanity of this world and turn towards Him. And they're telling them that same thing, to turn to the Creator. Then they say, hey, in verse 16, hey, God, at one point, let your nation live in darkness. Let the Gentiles live in darkness Just as we see in Romans 3, he allowed the sin in the world so that he can show grace. There is sin perpetuating because he doesn't want to eliminate the people. He wants to give them a chance to turn to him. And I I think that's an important point here to understand that when God, it's called divine forbearance, When God is waiting patiently for people who are sinful to turn to him, it's not that he's endorsing their sin. It's that he wants them to come to him in their time and make that choice to follow him. But some people never do. As we see here, some people never, ever obey the gospel. They hear it, like these people in in Acts 14, verse 18, they hear it. They know that God has done things in their lives. They know the true blessings that God gives them in just the daily life that they live. Every breath in our lifetime, every breath for unbelievers is a gift from God. And they know that. But in verse 18, it doesn't change anything. In verse 18, it says, Even with these words, they scarcely restrained the people from offering sacrifice to them. These people who wanted to worship Paul and Barnabas continued to worship them because they would rather live in darkness than know the truth. Because when you live in darkness, you could do all sorts of sins in the darkness. But when you're in the truth, all those sins are exposed and it's a scary place. So they wanted to live in darkness. They wanted to keep it to themselves. No, we'll we'll worship Paul and Barnabas. We see this all the time when we share with people. They want to add Jesus as just another little thing to their life, but not as their life. They want Jesus as a garnish to their dish, but not the main portion, not the meat But no, that's not how it works. Jesus is so important. He's everything to us. And if you're not making him the center of your life, you can't call yourself a Christian. I don't care 
how long you've been in the church. I don't care how long you've said you're a Christian. If you don't really put Jesus as the main thing in your life, above all else, you're not a Christian. And you're fooling yourself. He is the center of our life. He is the center of our entire being. And yes, we go wayward and we, we have good days and bad days and we do all of that, I understand. But in general, you know your heart. And it is so deceitful and sick. And you know your heart far better than I know it. And if you're not making sure that Christ is the Lord and the King of your heart, then you're not a Christian. You're a phony. So today, I want you to hear this. Two, two little messages. One to those who are not Christians or not really Christians inside. This is a day that you can turn from that and turn to Him. Stop worshiping the things of this world Stop thinking that Zeus and Hermes are still walking around. Stop thinking that this is just a little checklist you do before you get to heaven. And you got to make sure you're all packed up for that trip. That's not what this is. Turn. Repent. Admit you're a sinner. Believe in Him. Commit your life to Him. Make Him the King of your heart. The second thing I want to say is to those who are believers, we're doing a bad job, myself included. I've done a bad job of doing what Paul and Barnabas have been doing, sacrificing and working hard for the sake of the gospel and sharing the gospel with people in a clear way to talk to them, to share the truth with these people who are hungry for truth. They're looking for something out there and we got the one thing that's going to satisfy them. And sometimes we can't even open our mouths. Commit with me today that you'll start. That you'll start sharing the gospel boldly like Paul and Barnabas are. Commit with me. Because I'm making that commitment today. That I want to do this. I want to be like this. I don't want to be that lazy Christian anymore I want to be one that actually puts feet to their faith, that actually opens their mouth. Today is a day that we need to make these commitments. Because we don't know if this is the last day for us or for those loved ones that we have. It ends so quick. This is a day that we do it. Don't delay. Don't wait. But instead, look at the mission we have. Yes, it's filled with difficulties, it's filled with many burdens, but it's worth it for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you so much for your word and for the men, Paul and Barnabas, who have shown us what it means to truly be on mission for you. Lord, sometimes we are lousy Christians we love to sing, we love to read your Bible, we love to do all those things, but we are very seldom sharing our faith with people. For some of us, it may have been <clears throat> months or years that we've, we've even talked to an unbeliever about Christ or even mentioned Jesus in a conversation. Lord, let it not be so any longer. Change our hearts. Change us so that we can be bold for you, that we can love you so much that we can't help ourselves from sharing the gospel with our friends and our neighbors and our families and our co-workers and the people that we don't even know that we can be bold for your sake. God, and if there's those here today that do not know you or that have thought and have fooled themselves and everyone else in this room that they are a Christian, but they're not truly. Let this be the day that they commit their lives or recommit their lives to you. Lord, there is no shame in that repentant heart. Instead, let us celebrate together this day as we take the new step into being better 
Christians, better missionaries for your sake. It is in Jesus' name I pray this.